Hi there, I'm the underscore twig and I like analysing game rules. For the next half an hour, I'm going to be going way too deep on movement in 1D&D. The new movement rules are a fairly large change from the ones in the 2014 PHP, and there are some things that I think they did really well, as well as some really janky stuff that needs to be fixed pretty ASAP. First things first though, I think we should do some groundwork, because the language here is a bit confusing, since everything sounds the same. So, if you didn't already know, movement and speed are two completely different things in D&D 5e, as well as 1D&D. Your speed is the maximum distance that you are allowed to travel in a turn. It is a fixed amount, normally 30 feet, although some races, spells, class features and feats can change that. Your movement, on the other hand, is how far you have travelled in a particular turn. For example, if you have a speed of 30 feet and have travelled 20 feet, you have taken movement of 20 feet. You can still move a further 10 feet. Simple enough for now. Second, every time any source talks about just speed with no verb, it's talking about specifically your normal, everyday, walking around speed that every single creature has. If it just says speed in a rule, that rule does not apply to any special speeds like swim, climb and fly speeds. One d d made this a little bit easier to see by always writing this speed with a capital S. I think it needs even more clarity however, so whenever a rule talks about your speed, I'm going to say walk speed. You'll see why this clarity is important later on. Last thing before we start the rules analysis, I think it's worth explaining why movement had to change. In most cases, 2014 PHP movement was absolutely fine and worked really smoothly, however there were some edge cases where it was kind of weird. I think that the best way to show this is with a puzzle, using the old 2014 PHP rules. For context, I gave a simpler version of this puzzle to a guy called Pack Tactics a bit over a year ago, and he got it wrong. So, you are a standard, boring, human fighter with a 30 foot walk speed, but you are currently riding a horse with a 60 foot walk speed, and a wizard has cast fly on you, not the horse, giving you a 60 foot fly speed. You start your turn and you ride your horse 15 feet in a straight line. You then dismount the horse, which uses half of your walk speed. You then fly 10 feet in a straight line and then land. Now, how much further can you move if you walk? And how much further can you move if you fly? If you're the type of insane person that actually interacts with stuff like this, now is when you pause the video and write your answer in the comments. Well, let's follow this turn again, but this time I'm going to put these two progress bars on the bottom of the screen to track the movement of this character during their turn. So, you start off mounted and ride 15 feet in a straight line. This uses none of your movement because it uses the horse's movement. Next, you dismount. This uses movement equal to half of your walk speed, or 15 feet of movement. Next, you fly 10 feet using 10 feet of movement. What do you have remaining? Either 5 feet of movement using your walk speed, or 35 feet of movement using your fly speed. You could even walk 5 feet and then fly another 30 feet, but you couldn't fly 30 feet and then walk 5 feet because your movement will have gone over your walk speed. If you got that right, well done, have a cookie. If you got it wrong, or just ended up confused, well that's kind of the point. These new 1D&D rules are designed to make speed and movement less confusing. With the groundwork out of the way, let's give Move a read. Warning, this is long. When you move, you can go a distance equal to your walk speed or less. For example, if you have a walk speed of 30 feet, you can go up to 30 feet when you move. Difficult terrain can slow you down. Breaking up your move. You can break up your move using some of its movement before and after any action that you take on the same turn. For example, if you have a walk speed of 30 feet, you could go 10 feet, take an action, and then go 20 feet. Moving around other creatures. During your move, you can pass through the space of an ally, an incapacitated creature, a tiny creature, or a creature who is two sizes larger or smaller than you. Another creature space is difficult terrain for you unless that creature is tiny. You can't willingly end your move in a space occupied by another creature. Climbing and swimming. You can use your walk speed to climb or swim. Some creatures also have a climb speed or a swim speed. If you use your walk speed to climb or swim, each foot of movement costs one extra foot. For example, if you swim or climb five feet, you must spend 10 feet of movement to do so with your walk speed. If you're swimming or climbing through difficult terrain, that 5 feet of movement costs 15 feet. Special speeds. Some creatures have special speeds, such as a climb speed, a fly speed, or a swim speed. If you have more than one speed, 
you must choose which one to use each time you take your move. For example, if you have a walk speed and a climb speed, you can use one of those speeds when you move, but not both during the same move. If you take more than one move on a turn and have more than one speed, each move can use the same speed or a different one. For example, if you have a, both a walk speed and a fly speed, and you use the dash action on your turn, you can use your walk speed for the move and your fly speed for the dash, or vice versa. Speed of zero. If an effect zeroes your walk speed for a time, any special speed you have is also zeroed for the same duration. For example, if you have a walk speed and a climb speed, both speeds are zeroed if you're subjected to the grappled condition. There's a lot of stuff there to unpack, so let's take it one at a time. First up, when you use your move, you can move a distance up to your walk speed. That's easy enough to understand. Paragraph 1, done. Next paragraph. If you want to move, use an action, and then continue moving, you can, just as long as you have movement remaining. You must finish the action first, though. If the action you take requires you to do multiple things, you must do all of them before you continue moving. The attack action is an exception to this. It has a bit specifically stating that you can move between attacks. Third, climbing and swimming. If you use your walk speed to climb up a wall or swim through a liquid, it costs one extra foot for every foot you move. Basically, you have to use twice as much movement. Please note that it does not affect your speeds in any way. It just requires more move. Difficult terrain does similar, but I'll talk about that in a bit. Next up, if you have different types of speeds, called special speeds, you can only choose one of them. As I'm going to explain in a bit, there is 100% a hierarchy here. Certain speeds are just objectively better than other ones. There's also a bit about the dash action in this paragraph, but I'm going to give the dash action its own entire section of this video. And finally, if any effect in the game would cause your walk speed to hit zero, all of your speeds hit zero. The example given is if you are grappled, but another example is if you are hit by Ray of Frost, Lance of Lethargy, and a Fathomless Warlock's Tentacle of the Deep, all in one turn. Each of those decreases your walk speed by 10 feet, which is 30 feet total, meaning that your walk speed is zero, so all of your special speeds are zero. If you had 35 walk speed because you're a wood elf, then your walk speed is still five, and because that's not zero, it means all of your special speeds are completely unaffected. You can still move 60 feet with your 60 foot fly speed. Something that isn't written here, but I feel is worth mentioning now anyway, is that currently, every way of getting a special speed in one D&D says that you get a special speed equal to your walk speed. That means that if your walk speed changes due to rare frost or similar, your special speed will too. While this is probably more intuitive for PCs, it may be somewhat odd for monsters, they are written with all of their special speeds stated as absolute numbers. For example, an adult silver dragon is stated to have a walk speed of 40 feet and a fly speed of 80 feet. Reducing the dragon's walk speed won't change its flight speed. Now that I've explained how move and your walk speeds work, let's move on to the special speeds. We'll start with the climb speed. A climb speed can be used to move on a vertical surface without expending the extra movement normally associated with climbing. A climb speed can also be used in any situation in which your walk speed is usable. Some creatures have the spider climb trait, which allows their climb speed to work even on the underside of horizontal surfaces. So, a climb speed lets you climb faster. Something worth noting is that a climb speed does not make you climb better. It does not give you advantage on checks to climb, and it does not make the DC lower. However, you actually probably shouldn't be making a check to climb in most situations anyway. Checks are actually only called for on slippery surfaces or ones without many handholds. Absolutely anyone can just scurry up a tree, no questions asked. The other thing that a climb speed lets you do is use it instead of your walk speed. At first glance, this looks like it means that you can just run up to a wall and then start climbing it immediately. This is cool, I like it a lot, and it helps make climb speeds not worthless. However, it goes so much further than that. I'm going to repeat two things. First, a climb speed lets you use it instead of your walk speed. And second, if it just says speed in a rule, that rule does not apply to any special speeds like swim, climb, and fly speeds. Can you link the dots? Let's go back to that climbing and swimming section of move. It says, if you use your walk speed to climb or swim, each foot of movement costs one extra foot. But if you use your climb speed, you aren't using your walk speed. That means that you don't need extra move. If you have a 30 foot climb speed, you can use it to swim 30 feet. Climb speed is also not affected by anything that would reduce your walk speed, unless it reduces it to zero, 
or it says that your climb speed equals your walk speed. This means that monsters like giant spiders completely ignore the secondary effects of Ray of Frost and other similar things. Obviously, Ray of Frost might change, but for now, that's how it works. The same interaction of the climb speed being objectively better than the walk speed is going to come up several times in this video, so see if you can spot it before I talk about it. Climb speeds aren't too hard to get your hands on either. I'm going to go over ways to boost your speed or access new ones later, but literally any PC can get a climb speed if they want. So, with the climb speed already eating into the domain of the swim speed, can the swim speed hold its ground? Or water? A swim speed can be used to move through a liquid without expending the extra movement normally associated with swimming. So at face value, swim speeds just don't look very good when compared to climb speeds. They can't be used in place of your walk speed, so if you want to run into the water and then start swimming, you have to spend double movement on your first move in the water, because you're using your walk speed. There is, however, one thing which makes swim speeds better than they look. It just isn't written here. I'm going to bring up some 2014 PHB rules now. Because there are no 1D&D rules to supersede them, these 2014 rules are the current 1D&D rules. You just have to take them with a pinch of salt, because they are very much subject to change. These are the underwater combat rules. In particular, I'm interested in the second paragraph. When making a melee weapon attack, a creature that doesn't have a swim speed, either natural or granted by magic, has disadvantage on the attack roll unless the weapon is a dagger, javelin, short sword, spear, or trident. So, having a swim speed means that you can use any weapon without disadvantage. Obviously, the amount of underwater combat you do in a campaign will vary wildly and I expect that it never comes up in most campaigns. But this could be a reason to invest in a swim speed. Next, we have famously the best speed type, fly speed. These have actually received a buff compared to the 2014 rules. See if you can spot it. A fly speed can be used to move through the air. While you have a fly speed, you can stay aloft until you land, fall, or die. While flying, you fall if you are incapacitated or restrained. If you have the hover trait, you can stay aloft even while incapacitated or restrained. Did you spot the buff? I would try and start teaching you some Spanish, but I don't know any and I don't have a pet monkey. Well, it's in the paragraph about falling. It used to be that you fall if your fly speed was reduced to zero or you were not prone. These were fairly easy to achieve conditions. Now though, you need to specifically restrain or incapacitate the creature, which is much more difficult. No more using Battlemaster's tripping maneuver or flying up and shoving them prone. You now need some very specific tools to knock a flyer out of the air. The 2014 rules also had a fourth type of special speed, burrow speed. Burrow speeds aren't mentioned at all in 1 D&D. It's unclear if that's because burrow speeds are no longer a thing, or if there's just no way to get a burrow speed yet. I expect that this question will either be answered when we get the priest classes with Druid, or when they release a UA for the monster manual, which I believe they have confirmed they plan to do. With all of the types of speed out of the way, I want to talk about some things that interact with speeds, starting with the new slowed condition. While slowed, you experience the following effects. Limited movement. You must spend one extra foot of movement for every foot you move using your walk speed. Attacks affected. Attack rolls against you have advantage. Dexterity saves affected. You have disadvantage on dexterity saving throws. Bonus points to everyone who spotted that this only applies to walk speed. If you use your climb speed or your swim speed or whatever, you don't need to spend any additional movement. Again, climb speed are just really good. Outside of that rules abuse, however, I like this condition. It makes a lot of sense, and it's immediately obvious how it could be useful. Those of you who watched my hiding video may remember that I had a real dislike for the attacks affected portion of the hidden and invisible conditions, but I'm actually fine with this one. I don't see any reason why it would result in rules jank, which is what my problem with hidden and invisible was. Overall, Good idea, Watsy. Have a sticker. While we're talking about conditions, I want to quickly look at the grappled condition. I'm not going to say too much, because I mostly want to save this for the unarmed strikes video, but there are two relevant sections here. While grappled, you experience the following effects. Speed, zero. Your walk speed is zero and can't change. Movable. The grappler can drag or carry you when it moves, but the grappler suffers the slow condition while moving unless you are tiny or two or more sizes smaller than the grappler. Because speed zero sets your walk speed to zero, it affects all of your speeds. You can't use your climb speed or your fly speed to get away. Note, however, that this no longer causes you to fall if you are flying, 
because you're not restrained. Movable causes the grappler to suffer from the slowed condition, which we just looked at, and ping pong, that means that grapplers want a climb speed. They could also just take the grappler feed, which allows them to ignore the slowed condition. The difficult terrain rules have also been updated. Let's take a read. If a space is difficult terrain, every foot of movement in that space costs one extra foot. For example, moving five feet through difficult terrain costs ten feet of movement. Difficult terrain isn't cumulative. Either a space is difficult terrain, or it isn't. A space is difficult terrain for a creature if the space contains any of the following. Creature that isn't tidy, furniture that is small or larger, heavy snow, heavy undergrowth, ice, liquid that's between shin and waist deep, any deeper and you need to swim, narrow opening that is sized for a creature one size smaller, pit or another gap of 2-5 to five feet, rubble, slope of 20 degrees or more. The DM may determine that other things count as difficult terrain based on the examples here. First up, I want to acknowledge this list. It's fairly comprehensive, but it allows the DM to add more things as they wish. Excellent work, Watsy. Two things that I think are missing, however, are fast flowing water, which would be a type of difficult terrain which you would only encounter while swimming, and a line saying, the areas of some spell effects. The spell effects line is probably redundant, because spells will always say whether they are difficult terrain or not, but I think it should be included anyway, just for completeness. Second, it doesn't talk about your walk speed at all. It only talks about your movement. Difficult terrain applies to every type of speed. No using your climb speed to get out of this one. The final two things before we leave the rules glossary are the two movement-related actions. Dash and the highly controversial jump. Dash action first. Taking the dash action allows you to make a bonus move during the current turn. Cool exactly as you'd expect. Technically, you can change which speed you're using on each of your moves, but the only situation I can think of where you'd want to do this is if you're switching from a walk speed or a fly speed to a swim speed. In any other situation, if you have a climb speed or a fly speed, just use those at all times. Now for the jump action. This is one of the rules that I've seen a lot of complaints about, primarily because it's an action. If you want to use this, it means giving up your attack action or your magic action or whatever. With the jump action, you attempt to leap more than 5 feet. A jump of 5 feet or less is treated as difficult terrain. When you take this action, your walk speed must be greater than 0, and you must make a DC 10 strength check, acrobatics or athletics. If you don't move at least 10 feet immediately before the action, you have a disadvantage on the check. On a failed check, you leap 5 feet horizontally or vertically. On a successful check, the check's total determines the distance in feet that you can clear horizontally or half the total if you're jumping vertically, round down. This jump doesn't expend your movement, but the distance you clear can't exceed your walk speed. So, something that I want to clear up immediately is that not every jump requires the jump action. If you're jumping 5 feet or less, you can just do it. The movement counts as difficult terrain, but it still doesn't require an action to do. That means that you can still jump over small holes or traps or whatever. While I'm talking about these small jumps, in the 2014 PHB you were disincentivized from jumping over difficult terrain because when you landed on it you would need to make a DC 10 dexterity acrobatics check or fall prone. They've scrapped that though and just decided that it now counts as difficult terrain either way, which I think is fine. Now, the actual action part. So you can either use acrobatics or athletics to jump, but either way it's your strength. If you roll a 10 or higher, you can then jump that far. Worth noting is that it says that this is the distance that you CAN clear. If you want to jump 10 feet, but roll 20, you can choose to cut your jump short and just go 10 feet. Also worth noting is that this doesn't use any movement. It's free. I'm not 100% sure about this interaction, since we don't have 1 D&D opportunity attack rules, but because jump doesn't use move, it might bypass opportunity attacks, which makes it slightly better than disengage because it lets you uh, travel slightly further on your turn. I hate D&D's simple language sometimes. It makes it really hard to convey a point with full clarity. Hi, post-production twig here. On rereading the opportunity attack rules, I can confirm that this doesn't work. Opportunity attacks are also triggered if you use your action to move, regardless of whether that actually uses your movement or not. The fact that this jump doesn't use movement means that you can travel further in a round than normal. Now, this will probably never be better than just using the dash action, but there are some reasons why you might want to do it, such as jumping to a higher location or across a chasm. 
Something really nitpicky is that these rules technically mean that you can only jump exactly vertically or horizontally. You can't jump at a 45 degree angle. I think that basically every DM ever is going to be fine with you asking to jump at an angle. But it's kind of weird that you technically can't jump over something. Last thing about jumping is that I just want to talk about the jump spell. Since we don't have 1 D&D rules for this, the old 2014 rules still stand. The jump spell triples your jump distance, which you would think means that you could jump 15 feet without an action. However, this is not the case. You still need to use the jump action every time you want to jump more than 5 feet, because it is hard written into the action itself. Overall, I think jump is actually fine. I do kind of wish it was a bonus action, but it's not burning a hole in my conscience. Right, that is all of the rules for movement, so now I want to talk about some ways of augmenting your speed, whether that's giving you more speed or getting a special speed. Let's start with getting that busted climb speed. There are currently four ways to get a climb speed in one d and 3rd level thief rogues get second story work, 7th level rangers get roving, you can take the 4th level feet athlete, or you can choose to be a climber ardling and get a climb speed right at level 1. All of these give you a climb speed equal to your walk speed, so you don't get the benefits of rare frost immunity. Each of these has additional benefits as well. Second story work lets you jump with dexterity, roving gives you a swim speed and also boosts your walk speed, and consequently your climb and swim speeds, by 10 feet. Athlete gives you advantage on jump actions and lets you stand up with only 5 feet of movement, and Climber Ardling gives you proficiency bonus on your unarmed strikes. Honestly, I think that all of these are actually pretty good. Even Athlete could be genuinely a good choice in some situations. I do kind of wish that Athlete may jump a bonus action, however. There are only two ways of getting a swim speed, either by the aforementioned roving or by choosing the swimmer Ardling. I've already talked about roving, but Swimmer Ardling lets you hold your breath for an hour and gives you cold damage resistance. There's only one way to get a fly speed currently. You need to be a 5th level Dragonborn. They can give you themselves a fly speed equal to their walk speed for 10 minutes once per long rest. That's a really powerful feature and I like it a lot. Next up, ways to increase your speed. I think it's worth pointing out that all small species also have 30 feet walk speeds now. There's no more 25 foot small species. The Wood Elf and the Goliath, however, increase your walk speed to 35 feet, and the Goliath's large form feature allows you to increase it by a further 10 feet, to a grand total of 45 feet. Other ways to increase your walk speed include the aforementioned roving, the epic boon of speed, which increases your walk speed by 30 feet, and the new 4th level speedster feat, which increases your walk speed by 10 feet, while you aren't wearing heavy armour. Speedster's dash over difficult terrain feature also allows you to ignore difficult terrain on turns when you use the dash action. Worth noting is that this is not just on your second dash move, it's on both of your moves, although you must declare the dash action first. On the subject of enhancing your dash actions, there is obviously cunning action, which you get as a second level rogue, and lets you dash as a bonus action. The fourth level charger feat increases your walk speed by 10 feet on your dash action move only and the Racer Ardling increases your dash action move by 10 times your proficiency bonus. Note that these do not benefit your regular move. Finally, the 4th level Grappler feat allows you to ignore the slowed condition when you are moving with a creature that you are grappling. So I hope I've made it clear that there are some really good things about the new movement rules, such as the number of ways of augmenting it, the slowed condition, and that absolutely glorious difficult terrain list. I hope that you can also see, however, that there are some things that kind of need changing. Chief among them is obviously the climb speed. Just to make it blindingly obvious why this is such a problem, I'm going to stage a race. Our first competitor is a dolphin with a 60 foot swim speed. It can zip around the water like nobody's business. Our other competitor is a 4th level wood elf thief rogue who took the charger feat to help them boost their damage in combat. Our dolphin won initiative and uses the dash action moving 60 feet with its swim speed twice, for a total of 120 feet. Our rogue is up next though, and swims 35 feet using their climb speed. Because it's not their walk speed, they don't need to spend double movement. The rogue then uses the dash action, and charge means that they can move another 45 feet using their climb speed again. And oh my word, they use cunning action to dash a second time and move another 45 feet. That's 125 feet total, and the rogue wins. If that's not a good enough example of why climb speed needs to be fixed, I don't know what is. Now, 
I've been thinking about how to fix speed for probably over a month at this point, and I think I've come up with a really elegant solution. The base problem that has haunted both the 2014 rules and 1D&D is that transitioning from one speed type to another is messy. In 2014, that meant that you had to do weird maths, and in 1D&D, they've had to make climb speed busted to compensate for the restricted nature of one speed per move, so let's just strip it out by the root. I recommend removing special speeds. Characters won't have a walk speed and a climb speed, they will just have that one singular walk speed to keep track of. Instead, second story work and similar could give you a feature that says, you do not need to spend two feet of movement for each foot you climb. Same for the swimmer Ardling's swim speed, and the Dragon of Born's fly speed could instead say, you can use your walk speed to fly. Now, some monsters have different speed distances. For example, the adult silver dragon has 40 foot walk speed and 80 foot fly speed. You can solve this really easily again though. Simply give them a feature which says, the silver dragon can move two feet for every one foot of movement while flying. There's a bunch of fish and sharks and stuff which have high swim speeds, but walk speed of zero. Give them a feature which says, you cannot move while out of water, except with the help of magic. As far as I can tell, this pose fixes the issues and makes movement simpler. So what do you think? Are there any issues with my solution? Or have I saved the world from the terrors of people climbing water? The only other thing that I want to see changed is to allow people to jump as a bonus action. Whether that's innate, part of the athlete feat, or part of second story work, I don't really mind. Anyway, thanks for watching. If there's anything else that you think I should go way too deep on, let me know. The rules glossaries of these UAs are absolute gold mines. There is so much interesting stuff in them. When the monk comes out, I promise to do a video on unarmed strikes because goddamn, they're good now. You will need to know about movement rules for that one though, so just give this video another watch first. Insert all of that stuff that YouTubers are supposed to say, but in particular, please share this around. That is the absolute best way that you can spread an understanding of how these rules actually work and hopefully get them fixed. Bye!